you to imagine with me for a moment that there are a set of bars in front of you, like jail bars. And in thinking about this for a moment, you're on one side of the bars, and there's somebody on the other side of the bars, and he's talking to you and trying to convince you that he has you in jail. The best thing, I think, one of the greatest things about the resurrection day of Jesus Christ is he defeated the enemy to such a degree that he will never have the power over a follower of Jesus Christ. And as he tries to convince you that you're on the wrong side of the bars, I want you to say back to him, he is on the wrong side of the bar. He's not coming out. You're on the outside because Jesus called you to bind and to loose in this world. You are here. I love the fact that the king of hearts, my father, has creamed the joker. The joker has no power over us anymore. I said... The Joker has no power over us anymore. But I think sometimes when we stand against the enemy, we try to do it in such a way we do not even understand the power that we have. All we hear is his big mouth, and he's trying to tell us that he has us. No, we've got him. We are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus don't know who I am. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. My name is Dan. And we're here today to continue the April Fools. And I want to talk about the King of Hearts today. By, by the way, you might wonder what this is not a missile. You're going to love this. Don't you lava my lamp? Just lava it. Some of you don't even know what is that? Man, we grew up with these things. If you're older than five, you know what that is. That's a lava lamp. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. I love this thing. Isn't it pretty? If I drop it, though, it's going to be a real big mess. Scripture says this. The foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The, the worst thing that God has, the least thing that God has, the weakest link of God whatsoever is more powerful than all the wisdom of the world. You see, my father is crazy smart. My father in heaven is so smart. He is in, so incredibly smart. The very least of the thing that he has, the weakest link that he has, is can blow away any wisdom of the world. And you know what? If you read this verse of Scripture, he's talking about you. He's talking about me. We're God's weakest link, but he has called the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He has called those that are not as though they are. And God has the power of the Holy Spirit to make you and me greater and greater and greater in him. You're the weakest link. Now we're going to be talking about some things today, and you may have notes in front of you, and I'm going to ask you to hold a few things at one time in your mind. It's kind of complicated, but I want you to grab it. So if you hear something that I say, write it down, jot it down, go back to it later. Go to that scripture, 1 Corinthians 1, go through that and look at that and see what God says. And, and as I walk through this, I hope you find something, a new power for your life. Because without that transforming power to live this life, we're just going to keep doing the same thing we keep doing. We keep walking the same direction we're walking. And God has called us to walk a way that is completely different than the way the world walks. And the joker wants to convince us that his way is right and good. But he's been defeated. And the very foolish things of God can confound the wise. My father is so smart, and you know what? He plays for keeps. He don't play around. My father plays for keeps. He loves talking about his kids. He loves talking to his kids, and he loves it when his kids talk to him. And we are his weakest link. I want to talk about seven things the wise know. And when I say the word know, I'm not talking about this kind of knowing. 
Most of you, most of you, some of you maybe know my wife Jan, but I know my wife Jan. You hear what I said? I know her in a very intimate way. God's not called us to know about God. God has called us to know him in a very personal, a very, very intimate way. I believe seven things that the wise know. When I say the wise, I'm talking about someone who follows Christ. Because the wise person is a person who has been energized by the Holy Spirit of God and has been made alive in Christ and now has the ability to see something. Listen to this. You can see things that the world cannot see any. They cannot see it at all. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, unless you're born from above, you can't even see what I'm talking about. You don't even have a clue what I'm saying. So let's don't get on a high horse and condemn the people of the world because they can't even see the kingdom of God. They don't even know the kingdom of God. But your eyes, if you follow Christ, have been open. Never expect people that don't know God to act like people that know God. But we do expect people that follow the Savior to act like people that know the Savior. They can't even see without God. The first thing the wise know, there is a maker, and I use the word maker on purpose. My father is the creator of the universe. He spoke the world into existence. He spoke the universe into existence. He made you before the foundation of the world who knew your name. He wrote your DNA code. He has designed you. He knows how you work. He knows what makes you happen. He knows what trips you up. He has designed you. He is your maker. You're not a product of procreation. God made you. He is the only one who understands you, and you can only understand life if you come under his authority and make him your maker. He's your creator. They say, well, I've never seen God. I mean, I've never seen God, Dan. Challenge me. You ever seen God? I've never seen God. But I've never seen my brain either. Sometimes I act like I don't have one. But just because you don't see something and doesn't do what you think it should do doesn't mean it's not there. I've not seen your brain. I hope you have one. I'm pretty sure you do have one. I have seen what God can do in a life. I've watched him transform marriages. I've seen him heal people. I've watched my father do things for people that are beyond comprehension. I said, how come you cannot thank God for what he has done for you? Can you see what he's done? He's our maker. He's our designer. He knows exactly what makes us work, and he plays for keeps. And in this, this thought, the people that know God, they don't just read the Bible. You can read the Bible all day long, won't do you a bit of good. You can lay on it, you can, you can eat it, you can do all kinds of stuff, but until you enter the story and realize you're all in that story, until you enter that story, it has no power for your life. You've got to enter the story that Jesus Christ has laid out for you. When entering the story, you'll see the power of God. You're his property. He's not just about your spiritual life. He made you. He created you. He made everything about you. He's designed you. So we're going to enter the story today. I hope that's okay. We have a little extra time this morning on purpose. I'm going to read some Bible. Is that okay? Can we read some Bible today? I think we need to read some Bible. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along and listen to me. And I'm going to add a little bit here, a little, a little liberty, if you will, as I read the Scripture, because it's so exciting to me. It's one of my favorite passages of the Scripture. It's found in Luke chapter 24. And in Luke chapter 24, there's a story that unfolds. But while we're reading the story, enter the story with me. Get into the story with me, because when you find Jesus in the story, because he's here this morning, I hope you know that, when you find yourself in that story, you find out that God has a plan for your life in the very beginning of, the, the very beginning of time. Start on verse 13. Two of the disciples, it says, and behold, two of them were going that very day. The very day that it's talking about is the day that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. On the very day that Christ was raised from the dead, we find two of the disciples Cleopas was going with his friend. We don't know who the other guy is. Probably Luke because he was kind of embarrassed at the fact that this happened. But he, they're talking to each other. They're walking from Jerusalem seven miles and going out into the country. They're walking. This is very important. They're walking in the wrong direction. They're walking away, if you will, from God. They're walking away from the reality that just took place. They're walking away to start a different life because they have put three years of their life on hold. They have given everything to Jesus Christ, and they're talking to one another and saying, man, you know, what are we going to do now? Imagine, you have poured your life into something, you believed in something to find out that it's not really true anymore. 
They started talking about everything that had happened that day. And while they're talking, it says this came about that while they were, were conversing and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. So Jesus Christ comes up and they're talking. He goes, hey, what y'all talking about? And they start unpacking the gospel story. They start telling God the gospel story. They start telling him about his own life. It says, what are these words that you're exchanging with one another? And it says they stopped, stood still. It's a limbic response. Kicked them in the gut. What are you guys talking about? And they look sad. Everything they had done in their life, everything they had put on hold, they put all their eggs in the basket called Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ, according to them, failed them. Jesus Christ did not do what they thought he was supposed to do. He was supposed to raise up Israel. He's supposed to make Israel the premier nation of the world. He's supposed to kick Rome out. He's supposed to lead a revolt. He's supposed to have this whole uh, gamut of things to take place, and he did fail his mission, according to them. It says, and when one of them, Cleopas said, are you the only one? And this is insult to injury. They have spent their entire life with this guy named Jesus Christ. Now, this guy, this stranger who walks in their midst goes, uh, well, what are you talking about? They're like, what? We spent all of our life. You don't know the tragedy I'm in? You don't know that I put my life on hold? You don't realize what I've gone through? And you don't even know? Dude, we are in a mess here because everything we work for is, means nothing. This guy doesn't even know about it. He said, what things? Jesus said, what things? Verse 19. They said, you know, Jesus of Nazarene, who was a prophet and mighty indeed in word and in the sight of God and all the people and how the chief priests, our rulers, delivered him up to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping, we were hoping, we were expecting that he was going to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it's the third day since these things have happened. This is old news. Some women amazed us. They went to the tomb in the morning. They didn't find his body. They said they'd seen a vision. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it away. They said, but Jesus, we did not see. Jesus rebuked them. See, Jesus comes back every now and then, checks on his church. I'm going to check on this gospel story, see how they got it. He said, we didn't see Jesus. He didn't make it. It's the third day. It didn't happen. He said, oh, foolish men, verse 25. Oh, foolish men. You're not wise, you're foolish men, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and enter in his glory? And he began with Moses and with the prophets and explained to them all the things about himself in Scripture. And then they approached the village and he acted like he was going to keep on walking. It was getting dark. He said, oh, oh, dude, why don't you stay with us? It's evening. He went in to stay with them. I think he tested them, and it came about that when he had, listen to this, when he had sat at the table, when they sat down with him and reclined at the table, there's something important there, because when they sat down with Jesus at the table, and Jesus picked up the bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to them, their eyes were open. You got to, listen to this, you got to sit with Jesus you got to be with him in his presence. you got to be with Jesus before your eyes can be opened, before you can stand against the enemy, before you can walk the walk that God's called you to do. You must first stay in his presence. The wise know how to walk. You know what most people do? They just start walking. just, just, Just start walking. The wise know how to do it, though. Let's talk about this for a minute. Because it's gonna, we're going to kind of contrast the way the evil walk to the way we're supposed to walk. It says in Psalm 1, it's the sixth verse Psalm, very first Psalm in the book of Psalms. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. Walking in, that, that is not a literal walking. That's like, oh, walking around, hanging out with people. No, it is a law of conduct of your life. You do what you do based on what your philosophy you think about, based on what you really believe. That's what you do in life. He said, not according to the counsel of the wicked. Don't have to listen to what the news is saying. 
Oprah saying. They don't take what the world is saying. They don't walk according to the principality, the power of the air. They walk according to some other plan, but not according to the wicked. The wicked just pick up and do it because it feels good. They'll do it. He said, how blessed is a man who does not do that. You take off in a direction, walking in a place, a pace, a direction in such a way that that law of conduct kind of rattles your cage when Jesus Christ comes back and says, hey, stop. Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Why, why do we call you Lord and you don't walk the way I tell you to walk? There's a simple reason for that. We'll see it in a minute. Because... Many times when we walk, we just do. You know, you just do. Like, let's just go do it. Just do it. There's a difference, listen to this, there's a difference between doing and producing. There's a difference between doing and producing. Remember that. That's like one of those thoughts I have you hold. Number three, the wise know the difference between the two. What it means to do and what it means to produce. In order to do something for God, what we do has to come from a production, from the energy of a life source down deep inside of us. It doesn't come by head knowledge. It doesn't come by doing activities. It doesn't come by doing a bunch of facts. It's not, it's not just, you heard Tony talk about this, Nathan talk about that. It doesn't come from eating of the tree of right and wrong. It doesn't come from, this is right, this is wrong, that's what I'm gonna do. It doesn't come from that. guys. Doing right and wrong, knowing right and wrong is just not enough. It comes from a life source deep down inside. It comes from eating of the tree of life. It comes from a deep place. It doesn't come from, oh, that's right, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. Man, if you go around trying to correct everything in this world, you're going to be a very busy person. That's all you're going to be doing. And that's the way the world sees Christians. That's right, that's wrong, that's right, that's wrong. How many people here went and saw the last version of God's Not Dead? Two. Okay, great. Makes my point. My wife and I went on a date Thursday. And I said, I'm going to take you on a date Thursday night. We're going to go to the biggest, the baddest movie theater we can find. We're going to have some kimchi. And we're going <laughs> to... I never had kimchi in my life. I had that stuff. I was like, that's like cabbage with fire on it. Good. I like it. I'm hooked on it. Anybody makes that, I'll take all you got. Okay. Anyway, so we went and I had a little kimchi. Went to a Korean restaurant on Yadkin Road. We went to the biggest, the baddest theater over there. Had a rocking chair and had a cup holder. And my wife said, man, the parking lot is packed out. It's Thursday night. Not 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This is like 6.30 at night. You're going there, man, we're not going to get a seat to see this movie. That's okay, we're together. You know, we were so full, we couldn't even eat popcorn. We were just full with kimchi. We were just like, <laughs> probably a good thing. And I think this is why when we got into the theater to watch God, it's not dead. You know how many people were in that theater? Two, me and my wife, two. <laughs> they must have known we had kimchi, I don't know. <laughs> I looked around, I said, we can roller skate up in here. There ain't nobody in here playing God's not dead. I think everybody's watching the Black Panther or something. We wanted to support Christian movies, so let's go do this. And this is really sad. This is a Thursday night, not 2 o'clock in the afternoon. This is 6.30. But you know in the movie, God's Not Dead, if, I don't want to ruin it for you if you haven't seen it, but it's a very different message because the message in God's, God's Not Dead is just that. You can't always just eat of the tree of the knowledge. They don't say it this way, but this is really what the principle was. You cannot eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil without eating the tree of life. Christians are not called to eat of the tree of the knowledge of right and wrong. We're not here to, to say that everything's going to be equal in our world. We're not here to sell that story. That story's already been sold. We're not here to feel bad about ourselves when someone hurts us. Jesus said, if someone slaps you, you just slap him back, didn't he? No, he didn't say that. If someone slaps you, you turn the other cheek. You've got to eat of the tree of life. That comes supernaturally. Whoever forced you to go one mile, he said, go with them too. That's not right. He didn't say, go be right. He said, go love people. He said, go lay your life down for people. Find a source in your life to show them and point them to me because they desperately need a savior. Whether you realize it or not, this ball we live on is like Guantanamo Bay. You're either going to be binding and loosening or you're in prison. That's the only way this thing works. And this, this whole thing is going to ball up one day and be gone. And Jesus Christ has called you and me to get, be givers of life. It's not about doing stuff. It's not about correcting stuff. It's about producing something. And I don't know about you. We've heard this story before. You ever seen an apple tree trying to make a, 
an apple. You see them out there grunting. Oh, apple, 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 apple. Oh, no. They make apples because they're apple trees. They produce. You'll know them by their fruit. Difference between doing and producing. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. Richly dwell. This, I think, is like entering the story. This, this produces all this. But living in the word of Christ, let it d- richly dwell within inside you. Abiding Christ, listen to me, abiding in Christ is not a morning appointment. Hello, it is not a morning appointment. Do you have to have a morning appointment with God? I really highly recommend it. It's like drinking water. You should get up. First thing they say you should do is have a glass of water to drink. But if that's the only glass of water you get all day, you will not be healthy. You need to drink all the time, not a morning appointment. It is abiding in Christ all the time. It is not a moment in time. It is all the time. Time focused on him. I don't know if you've ever done this or not. I've done it. When your wife's not, guys, when your wife's not noticing you, She's not, you know, bah, 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 bah. you know, I mean, talking to you, whatever that is. I'm in trouble. Anyway, when she, she's not asking you to do something politely and very nicely, um, watch her work, whatever she does. You know, my wife washes clothes and she just admire her. Just admire her. Not in for anything, not trying to set nothing up. Just admire your wife. Start thinking good thoughts instead of the negative thoughts. See what the world tells you? Walk the way of the world. Oh, you need to get rid of her. She don't, she don't work fast enough. Whatever. Get rid of her. She's not pretty enough. Get rid of her. Get another one. You get another one, they're a whole lot better. That's the way of the world. You start admiring your wife and what she's doing for you. Start watching what she does, how she takes. I, I watch my wife when she handles the grandkids. My grandkids are over last night. We had two of them. It's amazing. How did she do that? I just don't have it. I don't know what that is. I wasn't given that gene. <laughs> I mean, I love my grandkids, but not like that. I mean, like, ice cream? Yes. I mean, she's just shoving food at them. I'm like, this is not good. Nathan's going to find out you've been feeding them all this stuff. <laughs> I come home. I went to church and come back. She's still shoving food at them, and the kids are opening up this freezer. I'm like, wow, how do you do that? My nose isn't running. I'm sweating. No, I'm just teasing. Somebody said, I'm not going to shake his hand. He wiped his nose with his hand. Thank you so much, Aaron. Appreciate it, man. Look at your wife when she's not expecting a response from you. It's it's the way this weekend's going, I'm just telling you. Joker's at Stay up here, man. <laughs> Joker's a joker. You know what? He's going to hell in a handbasket. Man, I got up here last night. iPad didn't work. Stuff didn't happen. It was like, he's so full of it. We don't need, we need Jesus. We don't need all this stuff. I can talk loud, but I like this thing. I don't have to talk as loud. I have to talk three times today. The wise know how to relate. Let's talk about this for a moment. The wise know how to relate. It's like, blessed is man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand. Stand in the path of sinners. We find out in the scripture that to stand spiritually in the book of Ephesians is really standing in the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit, the gospel shoes, the the shield of faith. And we're standing. So when you've done everything you can do, stand. But you can't stand if you don't know how to sit. If you haven't sat with Jesus, you cannot stand. Standing in the paths of sinners is when you surround yourself with 365 degrees of people that are telling you one thing. You're feeding your mind with that. You're standing in that place. It will lead to the next thing. When you stand in that place and let all that stuff come to you, all the opinion of the world, well, they're important people. They're Hollywood movie stars. Surely they know how to live life. Let's listen to them. You stand in that place. 
God's called us to stand against the enemies. There's two different ways to do this. The Bible says the wise know how to prosper. You see our two friends, our two disciples in our early story? They're walking one direction. They're walking away from Jerusalem. They're walking away from, you know why they're walking away? You know why they're going to the country? Because in Jerusalem, they're next. All the disciples are going to be killed now. They're out of there. They're like, we are gone. We're, we're leaving. But what did Jesus do? He said, let's, let's walk this back a little bit, guys. You foolish guys. Let's have a little faith here. Weren't I supposed to suffer? Weren't I supposed to go through all that stuff? And in that moment, they realized he was alive. They had been in that place of sitting with Christ. Now they know how to prosper. They got up that very moment in the dark and ran seven miles back to the enemy's camp into Jerusalem. They're walking a different direction. They're talking a different gospel. They're standing against the enemy. And now now they've been empowered by the, the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you don't have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in your life, your gospel is dead. Jesus Christ can die for your sins. He did die for your sins. It wiped the slate clean. You're accepted before God. But here's the deal. The resurrection power, if that spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he'll raise you. And when he raises you, he's putting you in a position. Your gospel's dead without the resurrection. You're not a son or a daughter without the resurrection. He hasn't called us just to be okay with God. He's called us to be his kids, to prosper. Sitting at the table of resurrection in Luke, it's a faith position. Because it goes on, look, not in the paths of sinners, nor sitting at the seat of scoffers. You know what this really talks about here, the sitting. The sitting is a position of teaching in their scripture. You know, Tony teaches when sitting down. Well, he should be standing up. No, in the scripture, Jesus sat down when he taught. They always, the teacher always sat down when he taught. The rabbis would sit down. See, what happens when you start walking around with ungodly and you start going the path of the sinners and you stand around that long enough, you'll begun, begin to become a teacher of it. And you know what, Christians, we do the same thing. We take off walking, doing things for God. We try to stand against the enemy, and then we end up trying to teach something, and we don't have the life of God inside of us because we've done it backwards. You don't start off walking, you start off sitting. You sit in what Jesus Christ has completed on the cross that day. It is in that position that we have power. You look at the book of Ephesians. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, it starts off that way. We are seated with Christ now, now, in the heavenly realm, now. So when you pray, you're not, oh, God, please have pity on me and my family. No, I'm on heaven. I'm up in here. I'm praying down from heaven, and I'm saying this is my territory. I want you out of my family. I want you out of my marriage. I want you out of my church, you joker. You're finished. You're defeated. I bind you in the name of Jesus, and we bind, and we lose. We have the keys to the kingdom. We can open prison doors, and we can slam them shut, and that's what he's called us to do. That's our inheritance in Christ, but we don't get that by just go doing it. We gotta be with Jesus for a while. We gotta sit with him and recognize him and see him be in his story. Our walk, here it goes. But his, the wise delight, is in the law of the Lord. And in the law he meditates day and night. This is not a morning appointment. Isn't that word law? Oh, it's the Ten Commandments. I go around and tell everybody how to live their life. That is not what that word means right there. Well, it's a Levitical law. No, it's not. That word in the, in the Hebrew, in the very root of Hebrew, is, is it's a word that's made up of a couple, it's a compound word, but one of the parts of the words is this. It is a picture of taking an arrow and releasing it. That word law there is everything from Genesis to Revelation, from the very start of the Alpha to the end of the Omega, from the beginning to the end. It is the law that God had set, the design that he put in the universe. It is the messianic trajectory of God through all human history. When you meditate upon that trajectory of what God is doing, what God has done, and where he came from, that is the law you meditate in day and night, not the right and the wrong. It is the trajectory of God in the messianic promises of his kingdom. You're going to meditate on that. What was the word meditate? What am I, like a yoga person? 
Meditation for the Christian is very different. I could talk hours about this, but let's just say this. The wrong kind of meditation is where you shut down the left side of your brain. Basically, you're shutting down the prefrontal cortex of your mind. You're not doing logic at all. You're saying a routine message over and over in your brain. You do that to the right side of your brain to such a degree that once you shut down the left side of your brain, the heart gets energized. It releases some endorphins and some dopamines into your system. You get high. That's what it does. A euphoric place, which creates visions and dreams. But we are to meditate in something, in the law. We're not to chant weird sayings. We are not to focus on our navel. We are to delight and meditate on the the law of the Lord day and night. It is a left brain activity that we say, I see what the word of God says. Now let me enter that story. And when you enter the story, you're entering truth. Because whether you believe it or not, you are in the story. This book is not a book written for others. It is written for you. It is written for me. And we are in this story, all of us, one place or another. When you take the law of the Lord and the trajectory of the fact that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, died for you and he rose for you and he called you to be his kids, a whole kingdom of priests, in that moment, if you meditate upon that, it will cause you to sit with Jesus in a way you've never done it before. Sitting with Jesus on on that, that throne, as we'll talk about in a minute, is the very culmination of that. But Job says it this way. In Job chapter 15, verse 4, he says this, Indeed, You do away with the fear of the Lord. You do away with the terrifying reality that the designer of the universe who spoke it into existence is the one you are dealing with, and he is in our presence right now examining our hearts. He is here this morning. He says, indeed, you do away with the fear of the Lord, and you hinder meditation before God. That means meditation begins with the fear of the Lord. The wise know how to fear the Lord in the right way. My father is crazy smart. I can't fool him. I can't trick him. Well, you didn't see me do that, did you? You know, like the Muslims go behind a wall and all I can't see him. Yeah. No. My, my father is crazy smart. Nothing to hide from him. I can't hide behind a bush. You can't put a fig leaf on. And I got to happen. The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's perfect restores the soul. Meditation begins with the reality that Jesus Christ came, that we don't have to spend eternity separated from God in a horrible place. That's a reality. But not only that, that he's put us someplace far above all principalities and powers. It says this, this guy, this wise guy, it says in verse 3, he will be like a tree planted. There it is. That's that standing. When we stand, we stand planted by the streams of water. We didn't have anything to do with that. And it produces its fruit. It yields its fruit in season. And its leaves are filled with life. They don't wither. And whatever he does, he does average. Whatever he does, he prospers. And I'm not talking about getting a Mercedes or a Ferrari. I'm not talking about a Lamborghini here. I'm talking about life prospering. I'm talking about life The ability to have life, the ability to stand against the enemy, the ability to have success in your marriage, success in your home, success in your family. Whenever you come into that position, you're able to stand against the schemes of the devil. It's not enough to know right from wrong. It's not enough to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We have to eat of the tree of life. We have to sit there. We have to be there. We have to, you know what that means? What does it mean? That means Jesus Christ did it all. He said it is finished, not I am finished. It is completed. And because it is completed, I am now the righteousness of God in Christ. And so are you. And whatever you bind, it will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. It's not enough to know right from wrong. The wise know it's a relationship. Talk about my beautiful lamp. My beautiful lamp has a good story. It's a good idea. I like it. I saw it on Amazon. I thought, I got to have that. Let's see, how can I wiggle that into a sermon illustration so I can have it? What am I going to do with it when I'm done with it? I love it. It looks good. It's purple, and these bubbles are blue. I thought, man, I got to get it. And you know what? It's, it's, It's like Thursday, I got to have it for the, or is it Thursday, I guess, I got to have it by this weekend, so I got to hurry up and do Amazon Prime and free shipping, two days. I did bargain the deal because it was an open box, but 
It, had, it was going to come by Wednesday. So Wednesday, I'm looking at my, my camera on my phone because I can see my house on my phone and watch him deliver it. I said, oh, I love the lamp. The lava lamp is here. So I get the lava lamp out, and I go out, and I pick it up, and I'm so proud of my big. I didn't know it was that big. I was like, man, this is big. It's nice. Pick that thing up, and I notice there's a big hole in the side of the box. I thought, oh, that's not good. I went and cut it up, but it had styrofoam around. It's all good. I opened it up, and this thing on the top was all crinkled and smashed. I bent it back out to get it to fit on top. I said, oh, that's okay. That's okay. My grandkids would probably knock it over anyway. Okay. And I so wanted to bring it because I wanted to, I wanted to turn it on and, and, and watch the bubbles come up, you know. And I want to talk about this thing that bubbles up inside of us that brings life. It brings life. It's that out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. It's inside out, not an outside in deal. It's being with Christ and sitting and being juiced up by him. That's where you get it from. Here's the problem with this beautiful lamp of the good story from Amazon Prime. It's broken. It's broken. The light bulb smashed. So I thought, I'll just put another light bulb. No, you can't do that. They sit up too high and it like wobbles. It doesn't work. You got to have a special light bulb. They wanted to sell it to me for eight bucks. See, here's the deal. It's beautiful. It's a good story. I like it. It looks good, but there's no power to it. You can plug it in all day long, but with no power, with no resurrection power, this is our life. It looks good. Good story. I'd like to have it in my house, but I can't plug it in. It's got no power, no power, no bubbles, no bubbles, no life. So you know what? It's going back to Amazon. <laughs> I love Amazon. I already got the packing slip ready. I got to have it for my, my illustration. God says, you're not keeping that. I want it back. So I get to use it in a different way. Without the power, it means nothing. It's just a good story. Without the, without the gospel part of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's just a good story. A good man died on a cross. But no, the king of kings brought us into relationship because the cross bought for us the power of forgiveness to make us his sons and daughters. That's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it bubbles up from the inside out. Look at this. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me, Jesus, on my throne. As I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. You think the devil's got you? He's scared, the fi- He's scared of you. Because one day you're judging angels. One day you're going to sit down, your big old self, on that throne of God. Think about that. That's the inheritance of the saints of God, a whole kingdom of priests because of what Christ did that day and the resurrection of Jesus bought that for you and for me. Think about that. Consider that for a moment. I don't work for God. God works in me, and actually he works for me. I do that and sit in his presence. What can man do to me? See, the enemy, the joker, is on the other side of the bars saying, oh, you like your little prison? You're in prison. You got to do what's right. Look at you. No, you're in prison. I'm the prison guard. And I can bind and I can loose. And I'm not letting you out. Now, if you let him out, that's your problem. Let them out in your life. Let them out into your home. Go ahead and unlock the door. Be convinced that you're the one that's in prison by doing what Christ wants you to do. Let him talk the talk to you. If you've ever been a prison guard, I haven't, but I imagine they talk trash nonstop. He talking trash nonstop. And if you listen to that, if you walk down that path, you'll find yourself standing listening, and then you'll find yourself in the prison, and he'll be out. And he'll wreck your home. He'll wreck your marriage. He'll wreck your life, and he can wreck the church. But he really has no teeth. Unless we give it to him. He's always trying to trick us. The enemy is a roaring lion, seeing who can he devour. But here's the deal. Jesus kicked his teeth out. He got no teeth. He's going to gum you to death. He got no power. Now, he might mess with me. He has messed with me all week. That's okay. But he's the joker, and I'm the king's son. And you're the king's son. Let Jesus work through you. Number seven. The wise know how to savor. You know the difference between eating and savoring? When I was, when I first came to Christ, I started hitchhiking around the country. Some of you know my story. 
And so I'm out there hitchhiking, I end up in Daytona Beach. I was in Daytona Beach here recently, and if you, if you are a hobo here today, that's the place to be. That is Hoboville. I mean, when you grow up, you want to be a hobo, go to Daytona, get your bags packed. And I went to, and I, was, I wasn't a hobo, I was telling people about Jesus Christ, but I lived on 50 cents a day, so technically I was a hobo. My wife said, she goes, oh, so that was what it was like when you were down here being a hobo. I, I wasn't a hobo like these guys. I wasn't a hobo with little signs. I was living on 50 cents a day. Four, four sandwiches of white bread on plain nasty peanut butter. That was my lot. That's all I ate every day. Bunny bread and nasty peanut butter. No jelly, no butter. Someone felt sorry for me. You need this. What's that? It's a box of grape nuts. Yeah, I, I probably do. But one day, and I had to have money in my pockets because I don't know if you know this or not. It's against the law not to have money in Daytona. You've got to have money. Called, you know, it's vagrant laws. If you don't have 20 bucks in your pocket, the police pull you over and say, what are you doing here, you old scraggly looking thing? You haven't had a bath. And you been, I've been taking baths in the, in the ocean. I'm good. He said, Let me, you got to have some money? Yeah, I got some ID. Yeah, here's 20 bucks and here's ID. You let you go. You got to have money. It's against the law not to have money. But I broke down one day, and I was so tired of them peanut butter sandwiches and that white bread. And I said, i got to eat something. So I went to the classiest restaurant I could find, McDonald's, <laughs> on my budget. And I bought a cheeseburger, uh, just a kid's cheeseburger. And I'll tell you what, that was the best tasting food I have ever eaten. Months of living on peanut butter, and I went, I just put that to my mouth, and I savored every piece of that bun. I ate every piece of that hamburger. I left it in my mouth so long that it disintegrated before I could let it swallow. I savored it. I delighted in it. The wise know how to delight in God. The wise know how to savor God. There's a difference between eating and savoring Jesus. We want more knowledge. We want to know more about the Bible. There's a difference between savoring and just knowing the Bible. Look, it says, finally, brethren, whatever is pure and honorable. I love this verse. What is ever this thing? You know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever, whatever floats your boat, right? Is that what it's saying? Whatever floats your boat, whatever violence you can watch, whatever uh, uh, immorality you can visualize on screens, whatever it is, think on these. No, it doesn't say that. Whatever's right and pure and, and lovely and holy, think on those things. Dwell on those things. Put those things in your mind. Savor, meditate, focus your attention on those things, not the negative, but the positive. Think on those things. Savor those. You guys want to write these down? We're going to hurry because i got to get out of here, but i got one more story. Surrender to your maker. He made you. He knows you. Say, Jesus, you know me. You may be here today and you don't know Christ. You just say, I'm just coming to church because my wife made me come. I don't know. I just came here because, you know, it's supposed to. I don't know. I, maybe you come here for a long time and you say, you know what? I've never really surrendered to the maker. I never really said, hey, you made me. You own me. I give my life back to you. Surrender to him. Examine your relationship if you already know Christ. Are you just out there walking and doing? Or have you find a place in Christ where you could just sit in his presence? Not just in the morning. Now, every day. Every day. Every day. Delighting in the Lord. It's finished, guys. It's finished. It's not always easy to meditate. I will tell you something that happened to me. Meditation in that particular context really means to cause anxiousness. It's contemplation that causes something to happen. And I had a thought the other morning. I woke up and this thought, as I was meditating, if you will, and I had this, this thought, and, and it disturbed me to such a degree that I said, I cannot share that, God, because if I share that, it gives fire for the enemy, and the enemy can use that against me. The enemy can use these thoughts to trip us up. I thought, he showed me what he meant, and I'm like, wow. I just went, wow, you're so smart, God. I just had the thought, the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that day that he died on the cross, he wasn't the first person to be raised from the dead. He's not the first person. Huh? Well, Lazarus was raised from the dead. There's some Old Testament saints that come up out of the tomb. There was a man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah and he came back to life. I thought, so what? The resurrection for Jesus then. He 
see where my thought was going. I said, this is really bad. This is going to be fuel for the enemy. On the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he was strung up between heaven and earth after being beaten and mocked and all the things he went through, claiming to be God, that's what got him crucified. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And then he said these words. He said, it is finished. And when Jesus Christ said, it is finished, an earthquake of a magnitude they hadn't seen in a long time split the veil in the temple, ripped the presence of God wide open, and it said the tombs were opened and the saints of old were made alive. Jesus wasn't raised from the dead yet. These guys in the temple, Jeremiah, they were alive now. I thought, wow. Read it though. You know what happened? They didn't come out of the tomb. Friday, in the tomb. Saturday, in the tomb. They were alive. Friday, they became alive. They're in the tomb on Saturday playing pinochle, I guess. I don't know what they're doing. In the tomb, what are they doing? You're alive. It says it wasn't until Jesus Christ was raised from the dead that they came out of the tomb. They've been in there since Friday alive. They came out of the tomb. And then he went and told all their relatives. He went and saw all the people. He said, many people saw them. Christians, maybe we're in the tomb in the moment between the, res- the crucifixion and the resurrection. Maybe we're playing pinochle with God, but we're alive. Jesus Christ paid for us to be alive. He bought it. He owes us. It's time to get up in the resurrection power of Jesus and walk with him to proclaim not the other direction, but walk into the fray and say, family, my Jesus is alive. Stand if you're able. Stand if you're able. You're in that tomb today. You're in that place today. Jesus is alive for you. Maybe they needed to be in his presence for a little bit. I don't know what happened. I don't know what, didn't say what happened. They just stayed in there. Father, you opened every tomb and you call your children to go out into that world out there, not to walk like they walk, not talk the way they talk, not stand in their stuff, but to first become part of you in the story. Learning to stand against the enemy and learning to walk, walk to fulfill the life-giving power you paid such a high price for. Father, let every follower of Jesus learn to bubble up inside by plugging that power into you that their life would flow, that others would be amazed and confess Jesus Christ really is alive. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, God.